So how can we foster kindness in our children? Here are the 10 tips. First of all, to, we can do that by modeling kindness and explicitly teaching kindness and respect. My wife and I are blessed to have 15 grandchildren from our two sons and their wives. And when uh, um, one of our young, younger granddaughters, Winnie, well, she was named after my mom, was seven years old, I asked her, I was actually working on the kindness book at the time, and I said, how can parents teach their children to be kind? And she paused thoughtfully, and then she said, they should be kind to them and stop them from being mean. I thought that was a pretty wise answer from a seven-year-old. So children learn kindness from the treatment they receive. So we want to be sure to take every opportunity to model that, to treat our children with kindness and respect. And when they're very young and they begin to get into a contest of will, sometimes when we ask them to do something or respect a requirement or, or, or a rule, um, if we can offer them a choice within the boundaries of the limits we've set, that can help to recognize their growing independence and at the same time insist upon the compliance that we require. Here's a personal story when our younger son, Matthew, was two, he was fiercely independent actually, and did not want to hold my hand whenever we had to cross the road in traffic. And it would always be a struggle. And I would say, Matthew, you know, you, I can't let you go alone. You can get hit by a car, you know, I'm your dad, you know, I have to keep you safe. But it would always be a tug of war and sometimes uh, a, a source of tears and so on. And when, one day we were in the post office, this was, um, around Christmas time and, and I knew I was gonna, upon exiting the post office, have to take him across Main Street. And we live in a small city of 17,000, still Main Street is Main Street. And I said, look, Matthew, we're gonna have to take your hand. And you know, I don't wanna have a problem about it. Don't wanna have a lot of trouble. And so he, he looked at both of his mittened hands and he said, take this one. And he offered me one of his hands. I said, okay. And then ever after that, I said, look, we're gonna have to cross the street I have to take one of your hands. Which one do you want me to take? And he would look and say, take this one. So he had a choice that still respected the rule. So that's a small but a significant way of respecting our children. And we also can use the language of kindness and respect. Language matters. It conveys a family value. For example, would you be kind enough to help your sister pick up the family room? That was a kind and thoughtful thing to do. Thank you for your kindness. How can you settle this in a kind and peaceful way? So use the language of kindness and respect whenever possible and insist on kindness and respect in all family interactions, including interactions with brothers and sisters. Don't allow kids to speak unkindly or disrespectfully, either in what they say or in their tone of voice, either to us as parents or, or to their sis. And if they slip from that standard, uh, which inevitably kids will do, we give them a chance to do a do-over or a redo say that in a more respectful way or you can even label that let's you know let's do a redo or let's do a do-over what would be a kinder way to say that and you make it clear that this is not to embarrass them but to, to let them show that they really know better and give them a chance to do it in a, in a kind and respectful way and that makes everybody feel better if a child has a bad habit let's say they interrupt people who are talking we want to try to replace that bad habit with a good one and to teach them the concrete behavior for doing that. Um, our first uh, grandchild, for example, was a very exuberant three-year-old. She would come into a room, let's say the kitchen where three adults might be in conversation. And she would, uh, upon entering, say, excuse me. And if that didn't get her the floor, she would say louder, excuse me. And if that didn't work, excuse me. <laughs> and then somebody would turn to her and say, yes, what is it? What is it? Uh, I call her Jennifer. And, um, but that was not obviously appropriate behavior. And and we wanted to try to head it off at the past, nip it in the bud before it happened. So we taught her that if she came into a room and we practiced this actually, role played it, and wanted to speak, that she would silently place her hand on the arm of the person who was speaking. Then that person would nod toward her, recognizing that she wished to speak, and then finish what he or she was saying, and then turn again to Jennifer and say, Jennifer, would you like to say something? And we practiced that a number of times and it required some continuing practice before it got into the wiring and became a habit. But that became something we taught all the grandchildren. And it's been a very successful way of helping kids learn not to interrupt. So we teach a replacement behavior. Now there's a lot of research that supports these kinds of things. One of the most famous studies 
was titled The Altruistic Personality by a husband and wife team, Samuel and Pearl Alner, uh, who themselves fled the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. And then subsequently went back after the war and interviewed 406 persons who were involved in rescuing Jews from the Nazi persecution. And 126 people who lived in the same Nazi occupied co countries, but did not get involved in rescue efforts. And compared to people who didn't rescue, uh, people who were rescuers said their parents both modeled and directly taught moral values, the very sort of thing we're speaking about. One woman remembered her mother. She said, my mother always said, do some good for someone at least once a day. So that's direct teaching combined with the mother's good example. Um, there were differences in discipline between rescuers and non-rescuers. Non-rescuers more often described their parents as using physical punishment, uh, often harsh. Rescuers remember their parents as only occasionally punishing and much more often explaining things, helping them take the perspective of another person, realizing that they had made a mistake and not understood the other person's point of view. Rescuers' parents were more likely to teach explicitly a positive attitude toward other cultures and religions and the obligation to help others generously, even if they were outside the family circle. One man remembered his father. He said he taught us to love God and neighbor, regardless of race or religion. So to summarize this, this step is to combine good example and explicit teaching. Practice what we preach, but also to preach what we practice. Step two is to create an intentional family culture of kindness and respect. It did 